Our scripture lesson from Matthew today talks about just wages, a concept that obviously is as old as time. Today's lesson is often called the parable of the workers in the vineyard, but I actually prefer to call it the parable of equal wages for unequal work. We've heard a lot in the media in recent years about a renewed call for equal pay for equal work, especially when there's disparity based on the employee's gender, right? One of the BBC's most senior editors recently resigned, and of course we know our own Lisa LaFlamme, there was a little bit of that going on with that too. After they discovered that either male counterparts were paid much more substantially than they were, or were given a pass as they got older. It is simply not fair. From the time we're toddlers and someone gets more juice in their sippy cup than we did, or got to go first more often, or hogged the swing all recess long, nothing bothers us more than a lack of fairness. We expect our friends to be fair. After all, caring and sharing, right? And we expect our parents to be fair. The rules for the eldest should apply to the youngest as well. And boys, as well as girls, should take their turn doing the dishes. You might detect. <laughs> Thank you, sister. I know it was a sister who said that. <laughs> you might, in my reference, detect a hint of resentment still lingering in my voice on that one because you may recall I have two younger brothers. We expect our teachers to be fair. We might remember resenting the teacher's pet, and you might really remember that mix of emotions of smug pride and discomfort and anxiety if you were the teacher's pet. We expect our employers to be fair. If they are not, we have government agencies to complain to or unions have our back. Mandated breaks, stated hours, safe conditions, an obligation to pay employees a minimum wage per hour work for six day, sick days, maternity, paternity leave, and compensation if you happen to be out of work. A great deal has changed since the turn of this last century and the rise of unions. Now, some will say for the worse, but most will admit that unions were absolutely instrumental in moving the industrialized world from a workhouse mentality where humans were simply cogs in the machinery of making money for the factory owners to a place where working conditions were not only better, but fair. No longer could an employer fire someone and send them away without pay for the time that they had worked. You know, say you're out of here, forget your pay. They have to pay them. Seniority is rewarded. Newcomers make less than longtime employees. Everyone is given their due. And despite any criticisms people might have about the union now, it was a system that was created with the idea of fairness at heart. And whether you've worked in a place where you belong to a union or not by 2023, I think it's safe to say that all of us have grown up very aware of them. We have a cultural sense of entitlement to fairness in the workplace because of where and when we were born. Yet in this passage we read from Matthew today, we see that the call for employment fairness is an old, old story. Without the protection of trade unions, day laborers 2,000 years ago were especially vulnerable. If you recall in this story, the first round of those hired were told what their wage would be, and those hired later in the day were told they would be paid what was fair or just. And one might be right in expecting a proportional kind of wage, half-day payment for a half-day work, etc., but that wasn't mandated. The owner of the farm could pay whatever he chose, usually far less than what was fair. Laborers would hang around the market square each day hoping to get pickup work. 
though still there at the end of the day, sometimes were called idle in certain translations of the Bible, where they just meant that they hadn't been employed. But we can't assume that they were lazy and didn't want to work. They had been there all day long hoping to get work. They suggest that it's likely that the laborers who remained in the market square late in the day would have been among those perhaps less suitable for work, those in poor health, the neediest, the poorest of those of an already poor class, vulnerable, powerless. And they might have eagerly agreed to any work without any guarantee of payment, simply hopeful for a few coins to feed themselves or their family at the end of the day. There was no social safety net for the poor. You worked or you begged or you starved. And then there's the landowner. We might assume that he's not such a good planner as he keeps having to go back and again and again and again and hire more workers. Is his harvest so much greater than he expected? Is it a bumper crop that year and he hadn't realized how many workers that he would need? I don't think so. My grandfather Smith was a grape farmer and he knew how many pickers he'd need for just how many days to get the crop in each year. Of course, if bad weather was coming, you need an army of helpers to come in to get the job done. Anyone who's cut hay knows that you have to get it in and keep it dry or the whole crop can be lost. But that doesn't seem to be the case here. There's no sense of urgency in the story, simply that the landowner pops back into town periodically and brings back with him more workers each time. Now, anybody listening to Jesus tell the story about 2,000 years ago would have wondered if the landowner was crazy or if he was maybe just really kind. And that's the hidden heart of this story. The landowner might be hiring people just to be kind, just to provide for their need, just because he was able. And if this is so, it might just give us a hint of what is to come in the story. At the end of the workday, it's customary for everybody to line up and receive their pay before heading home. Usually, those first hired would get their money and be the first out the door. The rate had been set. It was easiest to produce, right? But paying the others might involve some haggling and might take a little while. But in this story, the landowner himself dispenses the wages. Not as foreman, but the boss himself comes and hands out the coins. He calls up those who have only been there for the last hour and quite openly gives them a full day's salary. It's amazing. Those guys must have been grinning from ear to ear. This was their lucky day. Everybody else must have been scratching their heads. They'd never seen this before. Clearly, the boss was crazy. And, as all humans will, I'm sure they started doing the math figuring out what this meant for them. If those guys only worked one-tenth of the day and got this much, then I should get ten times what he told me, right? That would be fair. And their smiles and their anticipation starts to fade, however, as the next group hired was called up and also got a full day's wage, as did those hired at midday and those hired mid-morning. And when the first group hired was called forward, the ones who had labored all day long in the sun and the dust, they too received a full day's wage. And they were furious. It didn't matter that they had happily agreed to the day's rate earlier that morning, that they had been elated to get work at all. It simply wasn't fair. Others had gotten more than they had received, they felt. And it wasn't fair. The landowner says, hey, wait a minute. I'm not being unfair to you. You got exactly what we agreed you would. Perhaps your sense of unfairness stems from your jealousy that I was generous to others. And there must have been a groan for some hearing Jesus tell the story as the message hit home. 
Oh, hey, I get it. You are saying that God is like that landowner. And that means, uh-oh, somebody's not going to be happy about this. Because, above all, we expect our God to be fair. This parable is thought to have been used by the early church as a way to address the tensions within the church community, which was made up of those first members who were, were likely Jewish and perhaps had even known Jesus. And then there would have been the newcomers, likely Gentiles who had only heard about this Jesus person. This parable served as a reminder that the good news of God's love and salvation found through Jesus Christ was for all. Not just the old guard, but also for those brand new to faith. How perfect, then, that we could get to tell this story on a day when we baptized young ones like CJ. The good news of God's love and salvation found through Jesus Christ is for everyone. You don't have to put years of work in first. We can simply rejoice that CJ has been welcomed into the family today. But imagine for a moment, some of you, this shoe might fit. A person who was baptized as an infant and who grew up in the faith, and went to Sunday school, and got confirmed, got married, raised their own children in the faith, and generally tried to live all of their life as a genuine disciple of Jesus. And when that person dies at a ripe old age, he trusts that he will receive the eternal life as his reward, as indeed God has promised. But then there's another person who has lived a life that was exactly the opposite, they never once thought about God or God's will for them in their life. They had no need for Jesus and lived the worst kind of life that you can imagine. But then on their deathbed, get a scare, and he opens his heart for the first time to Jesus and genuinely repents just before he takes his last breath. Well, what of him? Well, he will receive eternal life as his reward, as indeed God has promised. It might not seem fair to you, and millions might agree. Surely this is the idea, as why the idea of purgatory was invented, right? People could not get their heads around the notion that forgiveness was instant and absolute, their own innate sense of what was fair required a certain amount of payment for past sins, even into the afterlife. A faithful person might get to go straight to heaven, but the guy who came to the game late should have to pay for a while, maybe even for a long while, before they enter into the glory that was promised. That at least, some felt, would go a long way to satisfying some expectations of fairness. But scripture teaches us that God receives the latecomer just as warmly as the first one who spent his whole existence working hard to please God and to do what is good. Is it fair? Not to us, perhaps, but it will sure sound like good news to the one who is lately forgiven. But that's God for you full of grace and pardon and welcome, no matter what. If today was the last day of their life on the planet, God would welcome our oldest guy here this morning and our youngest guy, CJ, in exactly the same way. It doesn't matter if CJ has just begun this life and hasn't done a thing to prove his worth to God. It doesn't matter to God if you've already lived a lifetime of doing good things and probably some not very good things, but only just this very moment you realize you might have been convinced that you have found your way to your spiritual home and now you want to be baptized at long last. You're welcome. We're all welcome without having to earn a thing. You can come just as you are. 
And that may not be fair. Not in human terms. But it is good. We celebrate today God's amazing, amazing generosity to each one of us. Union rules do not apply in the kingdom of God. And thank God for that. Rather than feel personally shortchanged because someone else has received God's grace with less work than we've put into it, why not rejoice in God's goodness that we all, all receive from God's heart far more than any one of us deserve? I would say to that, thanks be to God. Amen.